Will Siri be your next college professor? Yahoo releases earnings without an exclamation point. And this generation's Y2K is finally here. It's mobile getting. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 321 for Tuesday, April 21st, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code TN2 when you check out. Welcome back. I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we give you a quick rundown of today's tech headlines, and we talk to the experts behind those headlines. Now let's get to a few of those headlines. Yahoo released first quarter earnings this afternoon. Most sources say that both earnings and revenue fell below expectations. Based on this news, Yahoo's stock dropped 2% after the bell. The company has recently taken many steps to redefine itself, including the renegotiated search deal and new plans for mobile that we've talked about in recent weeks. And last week, we talked about the Every Child Gets an iPad debacle in Los Angeles. LAUSD, the nation's second largest school district, has asked for a refund for the $1.3 billion worth of iPads they bought. At the same time, district officials are coming under investigation by the SEC to find out if there was any shadiness in how they bought them. Now, it's safe to say that integrating technology into classrooms in elementary schools is not going so well everywhere. But how is it going in higher education? We thought we'd get the perspective of tenured professor David R. Wheeler. Welcome back, David. Thanks. It's great to be back. Thanks. Thanks for coming. So you've written before about online classes, and you're not exactly a fan. Tell us what you don't like about them. Okay. Well, I should disclaimer first. I uh, I love incorporating technology into my class. I can't teach without everyone being connected to the internet and a video projector that's also connected, you know, to my laptop and to the internet. Uh, all of my 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 syllabi and my rubrics students turn in assignments and I receive assignments all online so I'm I it's not that I'm against and I've taught online hybrid classes meaning partially online partially in the seat so it's not that I'm against online education what I'm against is the sloppy way that it is currently being done and it is costing taxpayers literally tens of billions of dollars the way it's currently done. Yeah, I, I didn't introduce that well. I was talking about integrating <laughs> technology into the classroom. And what I meant was online classes. Like, I'm not even going to sign up for college. I'm just going to sit in my living room and watch a professor. So, yeah, those are two different things. Sorry about that. So, so what we're talking about now is online classrooms versus what you do, you know, in the liberal arts college, a professor, an experienced tenured professor, face-to-face -face with students versus at home, YouTube, or some other way of learning. So, so what don't you like about that? Well, I, I, I should also say I, I am in favor of using all available technology uh, in, in, in the best possible way. The problem that we have with it, what we're doing is we're combining two things and at the moment, not forever, but at the moment, it's a deadly combination. And it's the online or profit model. And when you put those things together, it's like a can of gasoline in one hand and a lighter, uh, uh, you know, in, in the other hand. And it's an, it's, it's an explosively bad idea. And, and here's, what, here's what happens. So we have currently outstanding student loan debt is $1.2 trillion with a T. It is, it's, it's a huge amount. And of all the defaults of, of all the student loan defaults, more than half come from the online for profit education world. And so this is sloppy technology. This is watching a lecture that's videotaped and then taking a, a standardized test. And what happens is most students don't even finish the degree. And those that do often find that their degree is worthless and they're tens of thousands of dollars in debt and they're waiting tables. Or I was just reading the other day about a guy who can't even get a job at Best Buy and his degree was in computer science. 
So what's happening is these online for-profit universities are very unscrupulous. They're, they're predatory and they go after kind of unsuspecting people. They have very aggressive tactics to try to sign you up for these uh, you know, to, to enroll in their class. It's four times as expensive as a community college degree, and it's often a worthless degree. How could this happen? That's another story involving accreditation and a lack of political will to do something about that uh, accreditation. So what you're, you're not talking about, to be clear, like Harvard offering anyone access to a class or Stanford, you know, for free. That's not what you're talking about. <laughs> That is great. You know, we we need to we need to encourage this as much as possible. You know, one of my favorite things to do is I don't know if you've heard of I'm not a paid spokesperson for this <laughs> for this company. The teaching company has these great lectures, history, philosophy, literature. You know, the, these great college professors from the Ivy League schools have these amazing lectures and. Anytime you can use this technology, let's use it and let's make it available to as many people around the world as possible. We, we don't want to try to restrict information. We want to share information as much as possible. Right. So you're talking about the for profit that, you know, we're not going to name any names, but the kind of shady you often see commercials mm -hmm. for them late at night uh, for universities. And what you're saying is people are leaving them without degrees or they're, they're not even, you know, they're not leaving because they never go there, but you know, they're, they're finishing or not finishing and all they have to show for it is debt. Exactly. All they have to show for it is debt. And there have been there have been federal undercover uh, investigations. There have been so many lawsuits and investigations against these, uh, as you say, you know, we, we won't name names, but the big online for-profit colleges, there was a federal uh, government accountability office uh, undercover study. They sent people to pose as students, and what they found is that you could plagiarize something and it was totally fine. There was one professor who told the student, look, it's not that hard to get an A on this. Here are the answers. Just put A, B, C, D. Wait, here's the answers to the. It's not that hard. So what you have is unscrupulous people in charge and, and, and they're abusing to, you know, they're not using technology for how it's, how it should be used. There are great examples of universities that are using online. You know, my university has online degrees and I think a lot of the brick and mortar universities, most of them, if they aren't already, they will be doing online degrees. And so I would, what I would stress is make sure that it is a legit institution first and that this de degree is worth something if you're going to especially if you're going to take out a loan to go there so who are the people teaching at these online universities these for-profit universities and they're not tenured professors are they people with master's degrees with phds well the these might be people who want to do a little bit of moonlighting they might be people who uh could not get a a full-time uh, job in the field. But the problem is that they, in some cases they're teaching literally thousands of students. You know, there's no way that one person can keep track of that many students. So when it comes to online learning, you don't want to lose the human element. You want to use technology for what it's good for, but not use the technology. Have the human beings and the technology together. One good measure of this would be, is the student-faculty ratio still good? You know, if you have, if there's just a class of 15 students and the professor and they're Skyping, they're having online discussions, that could be maybe a better class than a, a, an in-the-seat brick-and-mortar class. So I would definitely look at student-faculty ratio. Well, so do, are you feeling like you're a tenured professor at a small liberal arts college? Are you feeling like um, technology is threatening those jobs? Are, are they going away? Are there going to be fewer jobs like that? Are there going to be fewer small liberal arts colleges like yours? Yes, there there will be fewer and fewer of these. People are leaping to the conclusion that it's all going to happen overnight, that the traditional four-year institution of higher education needs to be eliminated overnight. And what I'm what I'm arguing is over time, the unbundling of the higher education will happen. As Kevin Carey pointed out in his recent book, The End of College, people eventually will get certain badges, 
so to speak, for achieving certain, um, you know, certain license requirements and certain certifications online, they will be able to prove that they learned uh, a, a, a certain discipline. And so it, just like your cable is, you know, people want uh, HBO Now and Netflix and Hulu and they want an a la carte uh, television experience, same thing's going to happen with education. But it's not going to happen overnight. And when we try to get rid of the human element, we're not ready for that yet. You know, how many times have you had a pleasant conversation with an automated system on the phone when you called uh, your bank or something like that? You know, we're, we're not ready for artificial intelligence and robots to replace humans yet, especially in the classroom. Right. Well, I know um, there's a lot of difference between higher education, between college and you know K through 12. Um, but The Atlantic, uh, who you've written for before, had a piece last month on K through 12 public schools. And Michael Godsey writes that in five to 10 years, we might live in a world where there's one super teacher who will appear virtually on a screen and most classrooms will just be equipped with a facilitator. So that's a, someone you could pay $15 an hour. So, I mean, that's that's the same, you know, the, the th same thing between college and and elementary school is is there's a teacher and there's students that, that's the same. So I mean, can you imagine that? And and why is this is this a good idea or is it a bad idea? Okay, this this will happen again, not overnight. It, it will happen. the The economic and financial argument will be so irresistible that we that it will happen over time. We cannot have an honest conversation about this without also talking about the loss of millions and millions and millions of jobs. We can't pretend like that's not an issue. So over the, over the next few decades, we have to talk about if, there are, if there's only room for a tiny handful of superstar teachers, the ones that are great at giving TED Talks, once we get all the kinks worked out of online education, who, and no one knows when that's going to happen, but it may be two or three decades from now, maybe sooner. We can't have an honest conversation about this without saying, what do we do about the fact that there are no jobs left for people of medium to even above average talent? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, my, my husband is a high school teacher, so I think he's beyond average talent, but um, I would consider yes. him one of the super teachers. <laughs> but I mean, but I also see that uh, I've also had lots of experience with teachers who are not as great as him, you know, having children in school. And, you know, yes. it's interesting because, I mean, you know, paying teachers $15 an hour um, isn't okay, but what they pay them now also isn't okay. So, you know, it's right. it's sort of a broken system already but i mean but it, it will be interesting how this plays out because you're right like the economic uh it, it, schools don't have money and if they're going to be incorporating technology and using it that way that that's probably where the money is going to go so yeah it's taking a broken it, system and maybe breaking it even more <laughs> i don't know well you know what there, there's there's a positive consequence to all this and it was an unintended consequence but what started happening is when online education started to threaten traditional education, all of a sudden we asked ourselves a very big picture question, what is college for? And the same question will be asked about elementary school. What is it for? And the answer is going to be that it's about more than mere transmission of knowledge, because otherwise, yes, you could just have Google or Siri, or for that matter, just the public library. Hey, go get an education, you know, good luck. So it, what we're finding is there is more to an education than just the mere transmission of knowledge. And so that's, that's, a discover, that's an ongoing discovery and an ongoing conversation that we're having at the higher education level, to be sure. Right, because a lot of teachers, that, that is all they've done. You know, they're just the transmission of, of knowledge. Um, you know, I was, my twins were learning the state capitals and, you know, they were telling me what they thought they were and I had no idea. And so I had to ask <laughs> Siri and they asked the question, you know, if we can yeah. ask Siri, why do we have to learn any of this stuff? And it's, you know, at, at age 10, it's different, but yeah, I mean, we, there's all kinds of reasons. It's, it's the stuff behind the stuff, right? It's the bigger picture that they need to learn um, and I think, you know, my 10 year old is not the only one asking this question in that same article, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of the superintendents of one of the schools said, you know, if you can Google it, why teach it? So what's the answer to that question? The operative word in that question is the word why, why teach it? 
And let's back up to the question, okay, what's the capital of, of California? Well, if that's what you want to know, then yeah, Google's all you need. But if, you, but if your question is, why do we even have state capitals? What, what are they for exactly? And how did they get there? You know, so the, these kinds of questions, Google is not great at answering yet. It's right. not great at answering natural language questions. And despite Watson winning on Jeopardy, you know, that, that it's kind of the equivalent of, well, if you take all of Alex Trebek's clues and you Google, you know, tap them all in and hit enter, yeah, okay, well, the answer will probably pop up if it's one word. But if the question is why, this is something that human beings are still needed for and will be for, we don't know exactly how long, but for the foreseeable future. So it's still a good idea to not just give up, but get a good education and uh, look for a good job because these jobs will be around for the next couple of decades at least. Right. And the other big, I mean, if you can Google it, why teach it? I know, I know you have very strong feelings about Google. I follow you on Twitter and that's a conversation for another time. But, you know, that's the thing. If you can Google it, I mean, yeah. you know, why is that, you know, Google could also decide that, you know, Sacramento is not the capital of California, which I'm pretty sure it is. Right. Who, yeah, who, if there's only one arbiter of, of the truth, yeah, if you don't, if you only have one voice, then that, that that's a serious question. I mean, you probably won't argue about what's, what's the capital of California, but there are certainly questions that you, you want more than one authoritative source to be able to answer for you. Right. Yeah. So what about the flipped classroom? I know, uh, you know, the idea is that kids can use technology outside of the classroom, watch videos on, online, and then really reserve the classroom time for discussion and lecture and things that, that work better with a real person. I mean, is that, is that idea catching on? Is that, um, is, is it some, is it our future? <laughs> Well, it's it's happening now, and some teachers are using it with great success. And I say, if if the flip classroom works for you and your teaching style, then go for it. I, I think it's I think it's a great idea. Um, I have been thinking, you know, uh, feeling the pressure of online education. You know, I'm I'm constantly asking myself, why would a student want to sit in my classroom? You know, so I, I was I was talking to my wife about this and, and I was saying, you know, what do people do? What do people pay to do still today where it has to be face to face? Uh, things like rock concerts and I'm like, well, how can I make my class more like a rock concert? <laughs> you know? But the point is, is it's, you want to make it an event that you don't want to miss. And you want to make it something that's about relationships. You want to make it something that's about mentoring. And I think there's there's more than one answer. You know, it's not just about the flipped classroom. That's one great idea. But but you can use technology for so many other things. And I think as technology continues to prod and to ask us what is an education for, that teaching itself will continue to improve. Well, David, thank you so much. It's always enlightening to have you here. David R. Wheeler is associate professor. Uh, at Asbury University or Asbury College. Um, is it university or college? It's, it's university now. It used to be college, but in 2010 it became Asbury University. So, yeah. <laughs> and people can yeah. reach Thank, you on thanks. Twitter. And uh, where's the best place for people to see your work? If you just um, Google my name, even though I have questions about Google and antitrust <laughs> and things like that, you can, you can use us, your favorite search engine. And if you type in David R. Wheeler, um, my stuff will come up. Well, thank you so much. Take yeah. care. Thanks, Megan. Coming up, the only thing worse than mobile getting is Facebook a getting and a man nearly gets swept out to sea to save his drone. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Harry's. If you're gonna try a new product, you want it to fix a problem. Harry's is fixing the problem of paying too much for overpriced razors. Shaving is not fun. Sometimes you cut or scrape yourself with dull blades. Razors are really expensive. They can run about $4 a blade. And a guy who shaves every day spends hundreds of dollars a year just on razors. And when we go to the store to buy them, sometimes they have them locked up in those pesky plexiglass cabinets like you're a criminal. I don't want to feel like a criminal. Harry's gives us high quality razors at about half the price of those big brand blades. They make their razors in their own factory in Germany and they're engineered for sharpness and high performance. Harry's ships them free right to your front doorstep. And because they make and ship their own blades, Harry's is a more efficient company, which means they can give you factory direct Pricing. In each kit, you get a razor with a handle that looks and feels great, three razor blades and foaming shave gel, 
The Starter Truman set is an amazing deal. You get all this for just $15. Harry's gives you a clean, close, and comfortable shave. Go to harrys.com, get $5 off your first purchase with the code TN2. That's harrys.com and enter code TN2, that's the number two, at checkout. We thank Harry's for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Facebook adjusted their algorithm today so that you can see more status updates, videos, and pictures from your friends and fewer stories from big companies and brands. That's great news for those of us who want to see more personal videos that our friends make of their dogs wearing teddy bear costumes and fewer links to the brands my friends might like. Although many news sites point out that this is bad news for brands and bad news for news sites, Facebook says that in some cases, post reach and referral traffic could potentially decline. In other words, Facebook is basically telling companies, find another megaphone. As if websites didn't have enough algorithm algorithmic worries today, what with Google's mobile getting. Mobile getting is the hyperbolic click baity way of saying that Google tweaked its search algorithm this morning so that mobile friendly websites will now rank higher in search results. In a post on the official Google Webmaster Central blog, the, the company chose to use a more friendly way of referring to the tweak than the phrase mobile getting. Instead, they're saying that they're simply rolling out the mobile friendly update. This update will affect individual pages, not entire websites, and will only affect search rankings on mobile devices. Mobile getting will take about a week to kick off, after which expect zombies. Ars Technica reports that around 1,500 iPhones and iPad apps have been downloaded that have been downloaded over 2 million times could allow hackers to steal your passwords, your bank account numbers, and other sensitive information. According to research released yesterday from analytics service Source DNA, the bug in these apps breaks HTTPS and could leave you vulnerable to a man in the middle attack. Why did Source DNA do this research? Well, because they have a monitoring service that they want you to use. You can check out your apps to see if they're vulnerable. And Gadget points out that this isn't really as scary as it sounds. The flaw is only present when you're using one of the vulnerable apps and only information you send through the app can be stolen. And finally, Mashable points us to another video of the lengths that one man will go to save his drone. I think we have this video where we can see that oh. <laughs> that's the man. That's where the, the arrow is pointing to where the man is when he could see that the drone was starting to run out of power. And he had a long way to run. And uh, is he going to get there? I don't know. I don't know. The question is really, would he get more hits if he saves it or if he doesn't save it? <sighs> there he go. I mean, he's quite a climber, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I don't know. This looks a little bit staged. He's too happy, really. <gasps> Maybe because he knows he's going to get it. So uh, what kind of drone was this? Did we figure it out? It's a DJI. Uh, so that's $800. About $800 he just saved. Yeah, he probably made a lot more on the YouTube um, hits that he got on there. Uh, either way, well played. Man on the beach, well played. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can always write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live at live.twit.tv every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. You can also just click on the link that says watch live at twit.tv. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am still Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.